Church, will y'all join me in welcoming the whole planet Earth to Big Time Burleson, Texas, y'all? This is the Open Door Experience. Boo! Well, my goodness, blessing and peace on you, friends all over the planet Earth. I call you guys blessed, everybody that's listening on the radio, all of our television networks. I say great big hello to you and the folks that are here today. Hi, y'all. Y'all know we just got through uh, finishing our big New Beginnings 2023 conference. My goodness, wowzers. I want to tell you, and then guys, we did our star party last night, and I think the funnest part of the whole star party was me just sitting up here picking and grinning by the campfire. Man, that was fun. It's like, what? Yeah, you, you have to see it. It was a lot of fun. Uh, the worship team put up with me uh, joining them last night, and I was so grateful. And guys, it has been an incredible week, and there's a way I'd like to kind of tie this up a little bit. I'd like to put a little bow on it. And um, I would like to say everybody all over the world that God is speaking. Church, do you believe that God is speaking? There's a word that's being declared and there's a grace that's being offered. There are green lights and permissions that you had not been aware of before and there is an increase of the anointing within your life for the day that you're living in today. And it's true. It's true. I felt it literally since January 1st. I felt a different anointing in my preaching. Me and Patricia King were talking about this week and we're like, man, there is a different anointing on us. She's like, no, there is. There is. There's fire this year. There's baptism this year. There's power this year. There's the overshadowing of the Lord this year. The fear of the Lord is a really big deal. And as I've been preaching out throughout all, all this entire um, a Look at 21 series, I can tell you that the fear of the Lord is something that you're going to be hearing a lot out of this big boy this year. Because every time I start to speak on it, man, I, my heart gets broken and I feel the weighty presence of Jesus in this. It's like, Troy... Teach people to be loyal to me. Troy, teach people I'm not the problem, that I'm the answer. Teach people that I am the way that you deal with all the mess that is within you. Christ, Christ in you is the hope of glory. Teach people to be dependent upon me. Teach people to look for my coming. Teach people to say, man, whatever happens, man, I'm so glad I got Jesus. Man, I'm so glad I got Jesus. Teach people to be loyal. Teach people to live in a consistent and constant awareness that the presence of God is with us all the time. So there's a certain way you act and there's a certain way you handle yourself. And there's certain ways, you know what, if, how, many of y'all, how many of y'all want the presence of Jesus in your mind and you want the mind of Christ? Yeah. Me too. And guys, that has to happen. There needs to be great emotional and mental stability Great emotional and mental stability where dads can be dads and moms can be moms and freedom loving people in society can stand against the sexualization of our children and say, no, not on our watch. You're not gonna do that in our city. You're not gonna do that in our town. You're not gonna do that in our, in, um, within our school. No. Like why? Because we're not insane. We don't want our children sexualized. And just because you think it's dramatic and cute doesn't mean we think that we have to think it's dramatic and cute. And it takes, it takes a bravery to be able to do that. And what's sad is, is that it takes a bravery now to do that. It's just sad to me that people can't even muster the courage of something that wants to destroy their children's lives. Like, wow, how about them apples? Well, so what do we need, man? We need Jesus. If I want to have stability within my mind, and if I want to have stability within my emotions, if I want to be rock solid, I want to just tell you that comes from learning how to cooperate with the presence of the Lord within those places. Do you want Jesus in your marriage? Then serve him in your marriage. How in the world can I ask God to be my rock solid stability in my mind if I'm thinking about sexual things with other women outside of my marriage all day. Like, man, Troy, you ain't gonna start talking about that again, are you? Oh, you ain't hurting enough. I'm just saying, I'm not scared. I'm not scared of anybody or what anybody else thinks. I'm telling you, this is a plague in our society. (laughs) Sexualization and identity that is not honorable and identity that is destructive is a plague in our society today. And the reason why it's been able to advance so far is because the church hasn't stood against it. 
And I want to tell you, man, I, I, I don't want to be the tip of the spear on that, but man, I was just, I'm not waiting for anybody else. Amen. And I just like, hey, so it's like, okay, I have to constantly steward my thinking. I was like, here's what's real. And I think I said this in one of the messages that I taught this year, and it looks like this. The reason why, one of the main reasons why so many of us go off into depression and we spin off into depression and we hate our lives and we hate what's going on and we don't feel good because of the way that we think and we just don't have any gumption is simply because we don't, we don't fear the Lord. We think we have the option to do that. And it's like, God's like, hey man, were you on the ball today? Or were you not there when I brought that person across to you? Because they're gonna go out and kill themselves now. And you were the one that was anointed to bring them to me. And you just didn't feel like it because you felt sad. Wow, that's pretty heavy, isn't it? And again, I'm not being judgmental towards you. I'm talking about how I fear the Lord. Like there's many times in the public, um, I'll be going somewhere and I'll think, man, I hope I don't run across anybody who knows me today. And like, why? Because I don't have any hair gel and it looks as a mess. And I'm all ragged out and I'm in my overalls and I hadn't brushed my teeth. I got zoo breath and whatever, right? And then I go, whoa, 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 stop, stop, stop. I don't have that option. King Jesus, you bring me anybody you want to bring to me. And I'm telling you right now, I will demonstrate you and I will witness you. And I'm telling you, they will leave there with an encounter with King Jesus. I'm not going to try and skillfully avoid people today. That little form of depression or that form of, hey man, you need to be still or that form of you need to back off comes from not having a fear of the Lord. It's like, man, I better get it. I don't know how many days I got left. I better get it because the day's gonna come. Well, what if you, what if you mess up and what if you suffer through something? Well, again, I said, I don't know how many days I got left and what's real is once I step into eternity, I'm never going to have a chance to sacrifice for God again. I'm never going to have a chance to be persecuted again and stand in the right place. I'm never going to have a, I'm never going to have a chance to feel pain and still stand with Jesus. And I don't know how many days I got left. I better serve the Lord. I promise you, that little girl that I showed you, Ida, in Belize. Guys, do you guys have that picture of Miss Ida? I'd like to bring that up. This little girl loved Jesus with all of her heart. And I promise you, if Ida could live 22 years in that body, in the poverty that she lived in, in the jungles of Belize, and be, and be madly in love with the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord help you if you can't. See, when I start talking about serious stuff like that, that whole category is the fear of the Lord. I mean, how could I walk away from little Ida's life without being impacted in such a way of, Man, if she can do that in that condition, what would she do if she had my life? I remember years ago, we were in the trash dump in Matamoros, Mexico, and, and we were feeding people and doing all the things that we do. And we, uh, me and Pastor Gina Zagueta was going to get up and preach. And you, you literally stand up on a box and you got a PA system and everybody comes around in a circle. And after they get through mining the, the trash dump, and it's just so filthy and it's so horrible. And there's all these little kids that are there and, and they have these quotas that they have to meet or the cartel beat, beats them up or they prostitute their kids or something horrible. So whenever the trash dumps come in and they get ready to dump all that filth out, everybody stands underneath it like this and as soon as it's coming out, it's going all over them and they're looking for something of value. And you, you stand there and you watch that and go, King Jesus, well, I watch this guy. And I watched him, and he got his quota of cardboard. He got his quota of whatever it was. But I remember he had this big, huge monster thing of cardboard. And I saw that, and he said, Pastor, I would be honored if you would come to my house. And I said, okay, I will come to your house. I was like, where do you live? He said, well, I live here. See, a lot of those people in the, in the Mexican trash dumps, and also, too, in the Central American and Southern, Southern American uh, trash dumps are there because they're not allowed to leave. And their kids, it's, 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 it's forced labor. And their kids are born in that. And many times those kids grow up in those trash dumps and have never experienced anything on the planet Earth outside of that trash dump. It's the same, it's the same thing with lithium mines. And I mean, we've seen these things all over the planet Earth. 
and the world yawns and wonders, what are the Cardassians wearing? Because the fear of the Lord is not there. They don't love what God loves and they don't hate what God hates and they don't take seriously what God takes seriously. And I want to tell you, the fear of the Lord is when you line all that up and say, I will conform my life to that because this is pretty daggum serious business. Well, he invited, I, he said, well, I live here. And Leanna and I, we were real young. We went through the trash dump and it's huge. It's just monstrous. It's as big as the city of Burleson. It's huge. And uh, man, we, we finally get to this place. And there's just thousands of houses and shanties inside this trash dump. And we get to this guy's house, and I want to tell you, this guy's house was nicer than my house. It was nice, and it was built out of trash. The whole thing was built out of pallet slats. It was built out of all these things. He found a way to make windows. He found a way to make real doors and real door knobs. He found a way to put floors in there, and it was all trash that he had made beautiful. And his house was amazing. And I, I want to just tell you, I can remember, y'all, the fear of the Lord coming upon me in a powerful way. And I'm standing there after leaving this place, and I walked out, and I turned around, and I thought, if this guy can do this life in this place, what am I supposed to do with my life? What am I supposed to do with it? And I remember the fear of the Lord coming upon me and going, Oh my, he has taken so little and done so much with it and he glorifies Jesus with it. And I remember some of my very first encounters with, with the fear of the Lord and just saying, King Jesus, and leaving there and going, okay, I have to own the impact of that and I have to let that change my life and I can never, ever, ever be the same. One of the holiest people that Leanna and I have ever met and, and we have like a list of these encounters with incredible people throughout the world that were game changers for us because of how they, because of how they knew God. Whenever uh, we first began to go to Uganda, Leanna and I heard about this incredible praying lady that lived way up in the mountains, the Rawanzori Mountains, uh, between Congo and, uh, then it was called Zaire, between Congo and uh, Uganda. And they're like, um, she prophesied that you were gonna be here. And I was like, really, how did she do that? She said that she prophesied there is a fat white man with a beard. <laughs> exactly what they told me. And he's going to be here in this region on such and such day. And when he comes to this region on such and such day, bring him to me because I have a blessing for him. Well, we didn't know where we were going from one day to the next day. And we were just going from church to church to church and doing crazy stuff. And we got there and there were all these people. And whenever they saw me, they, they, they sound like Comanche Indians. They all start going, okay, they all start doing that and jumping up and down. And they're like, what? And they're like, hey, man, the woman of God said that you were going to be here. So me and Leanna went up there. And this lady lived in this tiny, she was old. And um, she lived in this tiny, tiny a little house that her husband had made years and years earlier, and he had since passed away. And um, she was out there, and she was smiling, and she was so beautiful. And she came out, and uh, we came out, and we introduced ourselves, and she said, the Lord told me that you would come on this day. And it wasn't like, hey, you're coming here because I need something. It was like, I have something I need to give you. And I've been praying about the gift that I want to give you. Now, me and Leanna had never really, at this time, and again, we were young, we were in our 20s, and we had never experienced any kind of prophetic encounter like this before with somebody. And we sit in there, and the incredible wisdom and just the anointing, we were in her house, and the presence of the Lord just started making Leanna and I just kind of, while we were just sitting there, we just started kind of doing this, like, oh my goodness, the presence of Jesus is here. Now, she had survived the horror of Idi Amin. She had survived so many incredible things. And she was an old Ugandan woman who had never had electricity in her life. And she knew Jesus in such a powerful way. She prophesied to Leanna. She also prophesied to me. And 
all these, I want to tell you about it, but it's not the point. The point is that after we learned Jesus in a whole new way, and after we experienced Jesus in a whole new way, and in an incredible way, after, after we, every, every hopeful expectancy that we had ever had of Jesus was wrenched from here to there. Have you guys, you should have had those things happen many times where just all of a sudden you, you thought God's highest was this for you and then suddenly it became that for you and you're like, oh my goodness, I, I didn't know. Wow. I mean, I, I left there going, I'm gonna live a prophetic lifestyle for the rest of my life. I went there knowing God sees me and God Almighty directs my steps because she sent a bunch of people down there to look for a fat white guy showing up. And I promise you, 20, 25 years ago, or however long that was, more than that, I, I was the only fat white guy with a beard. I was a walking freak show. <laughs> Nobody over there has a beard. There wasn't any white people at all, and there wasn't no fat people. And people would just show up just to gawk at me. <laughs> and she... And I was a lot fatter then than I am now. And I mean, she, she nailed it. And so we were out there. But after it was all over with, and after she prophesied to us and laid hands on us and the fire of the Holy Spirit hit us and just this, this extravagant love of Jesus that we had never found in America and we only found it in the mountains of Uganda. This thing that happened while when we bawled and squalled and we believed, we believed God in a whole new way and a big part of the thing that she prayed for us was financial and just said, oh, the Lord is going to trust you with such finances and this, this, this. And she actually told me to hold out my hands and she acted like she placed something in my hand and then she put her hands around it and she prayed. And I felt, I felt the fire of the Holy Spirit within me. I, I, I mean, I, I felt, you know, I want to stop and say this. I was at the back of this church a while ago and this is right before praise and worship. Praise and worship had actually just started and a lady walked in here for the first time. She didn't even know I was a pastor and she pulled on my, my jacket, said yes. And she was just standing there and I was like, do you need help finding a seat? She said, I feel clean. What is this? That, that happened right before this church service. It just happened. Well, hey man, we know what that is, right? The Lord makes you cleaner than a fuller soap. That's what the word of God says. Out of all the games that we play, out of all the things that we do, out of all the humanity, out of all the stupidity, what's real is sometimes Jesus would just show up and just change everything. My good friend Hippie that sings up here, you know what I'm talking about? She's singing up here today. She don't ever wear her shoes. And part of that is because she has giant feet. <laughs> and her toes are like sausages. <laughs> That's so not true. She's sitting right over there. There she is right there. Look, she doesn't have shoes on right now. <laughs> the reason why a hippie doesn't wear shoes is because that happened to her whenever she walked in here. Isn't that the truth, sweetie? She walked in here and, and having never experienced Jesus before, just walked in and went, oh, Jesus. And she had an encounter with the Lord just walking in the room. And so she considers this place holy ground. And it just happens she has pretty feet, so that works out for you. That would not work out for me. <laughs> Big Jurassic Park toenail. <laughs> Praise God, people running and screaming, throwing up. <laughs> well, that, that happened at the beginning of this service. That happened. I, I feel clean, what is this? Somebody just tears running down her face. I feel clean, what is this? Uh, it's, it's the breath of God. You're clean through the words that I've spoken unto you, Jesus said. You're hearing God speak, and he makes you clean. That's what he does. Don't you love that? That day, guys, we left that. We, we got ready to leave after having this extraordinary day with her, and we said, you know what, man? I don't know when the next time we're ever gonna see you is. And she said, you won't see me this side of heaven. I said, no, no, we're gonna be friends for years and years to come. She said, we will, but not on this side of heaven. And I, I knew it. I was like, this amazing prophet, this amazing woman who carried the presence of Jesus in such an extraordinary way, 
that it, I mean, it, it was crazy. And me and Leanna were crying. And we said, come go with us. Come go with us down from this mountain and let us take you to a restaurant. And listen, we'll put you up in a hotel room. And uh, we, we want to take you to a restaurant and we want to honor you. And we just want to be with you for a couple of days. And she said, no, no, no. And she said, I've never stayed in a hotel. Like you've never been in a hotel in your life? She said, no, this is the only room I've ever lived in my entire life. And I said, well, come down and let us, let us feed you and let us honor you. And let us, please, please let us just take care of you. And this is what that lady told me and, Leon, me and Leanna. Oh, I couldn't go to a restaurant and eat. I'm like, why? She goes, because they would kill me. I'm like, why? And she said, because the only food I have ever eaten in my entire life, um, Leanna, what was it? It was sweet potatoes and uh, plantains. That was it. She'd never had anything in her life outside of that because that's what grows around the ground around there. Never had a steak. Never had a chicken fried steak, which is a horror from hell. <laughs> the injustice of that makes me so mad. Literally her entire life, she had only had two kinds of food. That's it. And, and we left there with this thing. I, I, I left there with it and it was just on me and I was just like, okay, if that woman knows Jesus the way she knows Jesus in a life like that, what does the Lord expect out of me? And I left there with a whole new perspective of my life. And you know what that is? It's the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is God's perspective of your life of, no, listen, I've trusted you with a lot. And it is my joy to trust you with a lot. Now make it your joy to bring my kingdom. I'm, I'm asking everybody to read Psalms 23 every single day this year. Read it every single day. There's only six verses. And get something new out of it every single day. The Lord is my shepherd. And, and, and the first part of that is the Lord is. <laughs> Not the Lord was. Not the Lord's going to be. But listen, the Lord is. I mean, he lives with me. And this is like a right now thing. And I need to serve him like in my right now moments. That's what the Lord is. And he's my shepherd. I'm not his peer. You know, he has fellowship with me and he loves me. But here's what's real is I'm the sheep and he's the shepherd. I'm the bride and he's the husband. I'm the investment and he's the investor. I, I'm the servant and he's the king. And that, that understanding of my life does not belong to me. It belongs to him. And you know what? I need to live life. And everybody says, well, it's just such a sacrifice, man, for you to serve the Lord the way that you do. It's such a sacrifice. Well, I want to tell you, fall, fire falls on sacrifice. And I want the whole world, y'all, to watch me burn. I want the whole world to look at me and go, man, I don't know what the heck's going on with that guy. He just burns for Jesus. I saw how that woman burned for Jesus and it burned me. And it was glorious and it was wonderful. And then the parting gift she gave me was, oh, I've never had the privilege of eating in a restaurant. I've never been invited to anybody else's houses or at least I was too old by the time that somebody did invite me to come and eat with them that my digestive system would just explode if I ate anything outside of my typical diet. And I thought about the poverty she'd face, the terror that she'd face with Idi, with Idi Amin's regime, with the war. Guys, Zaire was at war with Uganda. There was a ton of people killed while we were there, and she was right on the war zone. She was in the Ravenzori Mountains. And she was an old lady, and she had lived like that her entire life, just going, I love Jesus, and he's with me. He's with me, he's with me in this little house and I love him and he shares secrets with me. Guys, as I close, I wanna just tell you that out of everything that I've learned in preaching through the 23 series 
and everything that I've learned through um, hearing all the other perspectives and the amazing views and the words that everybody else has given for the year 2023. My big takeaway is this, just like what Pauline said this morning, we don't have anything more valuable. Therefore, we have no greater treasure to protect and to behold than Jesus within our own lives. And if we have taken that for granted, we need to repent. And I realize I've taken it for granted in so many different ways. And I've been on this journey in the past couple of months where I'm like, I ain't taking that for granted. Exodus 20, 23, God says, don't put any other gods with me. He's like, don't, don't put me on the same shelf with any other gods. Make me special and treasure me. Don't you do that. That's a really big deal. Proverbs 20, 23 says, different kinds of weights are an abomination to the Lord and dishonest scales are not good. Do you know what an honest scale is? His scale. And if he says, hey man, if I see it this way, can you please see it this way? Oh yeah, well I'll see it this way, but what's real is, I also have a different standard for this and for that and for that. Well, I'm showing you what the standard is. Why don't you measure that the way that I measure it? John 20, verse 23. This is a really big deal. I told you at the end of 2022 that God's speaking to me a lot just about forgiveness. Man, dude, you just gotta forgive people. You don't wanna have unforgiveness in your life. It doesn't mean that you have to let, continue to let people beat you up or whatever that is. But I wanna just tell you, your forgiveness towards somebody else is not a you and them issue. It is a you and Jesus issue. Amen. Also, 1 Samuel 20, 23 is about covenant relationships. The Lord be between you and me forever. I, I think it's so important for us as a tribe to have covenant relationships with each other that we do not. And I want to tell you, you're going to have people that are going to want you when something, when something doesn't go right and and you're offended or they're offended, you're gonna be tempted by people that might love Jesus, but they don't have the fear of the Lord to begin to join the Facebook mob against those people. And you have no business being in that part. You are not the paparazzi that you report trash. Do, do you know what paparazzi actually means, the word paparazzi? It actually means Lord of the Flies. Do you know who the Lord of the Flies is? It's the devil. It's Beelzebub. That's what Beelzebub means, is Lord of the Flies. After I'm off this television show, I'll tell you what it really means. Because what it really means is a whole lot worse than that. Uh, get ready, Europe, I'm gonna say it. It means the king of crap. That's what Beelzebub, that's right, Rochelle. And you don't want to be in league with that king. There's no reason for you to. Fear the Lord and he'll make you clean. Guys, let's give Jesus a great big praise. Let's do that. So good. Awesome.